This is Eddie Bauer Alpine Guide Seth Waterfall. And this is Eddie Bauer Alpine Guide Melissa Arnott Reed. And we're answering the internet's most asked questions about mountaineering. What is mountaineering? The standard line that I always give people is uh, it is slowly walking uphill while not feeling very good. Exactly. It's nearing on a mountain. <laughs> but in reality, it's, uh, it's just the art and science of how to climb large mountains. I think the differentiation between hiking and mountaineering is when you start to use mountaineering specific tools and costumes. So you have like crampon spikes on your feet or you're using ice axes or there's some ropes involved on technical terrain. That's, that's where it becomes mountaineering for me. But if you find yourself slowly walking uphill and you're not feeling very good? Probably mountaineering. That's right. <laughs> How do you train for mountaineering? I feel like I train for everything by trying to mimic the activity that I'm going to be doing. And as Seth said, mountaineering is really just walking uphill slowly while not feeling very good. So I try to mimic that conditions by walking uphill in smaller zones, either like even in the gym on a step mill or a local hill or like stadium steps with a weighted pack. And that's sort of just like the physical conditioning side of training for mountaineering. Yeah, if you're in the gym looking crazy with a bunch of uh, weight on a vest or in a backpack, you're probably training for mountaineering in the most perfect way. It's really hard to simulate yeah. big mountains in uh, another environment. So getting practice, starting with smaller mountains and building your way up is a great way to train. And I think one of the most important parts of training for mountaineering is figuring out the difference between uh, discomfort and danger. So yeah. that requires like making yourself feel really uncomfortable and getting intimate with what that feeling is so that you know where the difference is, where you start to just not be uncomfortable, but things are maybe like a dangerous time. Yeah. In that vein, if uh, your first time in a big mountain also has a lot of other firsts along with it, first time in crampons, first time with big boots, first time with a harness, that's maybe a little too much. So break it into small chunks and practice before you get to the, the real big mountains. Ooh, how should mountaineering boots fit? I think an easy way to answer this is they should not fit like your ski boots. A lot of people put on a mountaineering boot their first time and they think it should be like stiff, tight, uh, potentially a little bit uncomfortable. You're gonna be spending a ton of time and you need the dexterity in your ankles and feet. So you want it to fit comfortable pretty much right away. Technology of boots is really advanced beyond like old school leather boots that had a long break-in point. And if your boot doesn't feel good just walking around the store, it's probably not going to start to feel good later on. So comfort, I think, is one of the biggest things. You bet. Yeah. And then adjustability, you know, making sure that you can fit it with a thin sock for those warmer days climbing and then a bigger sock on those cooler days climbing and that there's some adjustability inside that boot. Yeah. You don't need to break boots in too much anymore. It's that's uh, for old school leather type boots, modern materials. Uh, yeah, they just should fit great right out of the box. What's the difference between mountaineering boots and hiking boots? You know, a lot of hiking boots can be used as mountaineering boots. There is often a part of the sole that allows for a crampon to be snapped onto the boot. And that's like one of the biggest differentiators. And then the overall stiffness and warmth of the boot. And I'm kind of a shoe person. And so I have a whole quiver of boots and it's a spectrum. And so I just have straight hiking boots that are low top, uh, almost like shoes, and I can hike fast in those. And then I have my 8,000 meter boots that uh, almost look like a ski boot with a giant gator on top of it. A true mountaineering boot, I want to be able to kick into the snow and, and make a good footprint for myself, whereas a hiking boot was just going to bounce around and deflect if I try and kick it into firm snow. Yeah, I think especially if you have bigger feet, right? Because my feet are so small, all boots are kind of stiff in the sole, but mm. the bigger your foot, you're going to need the stiffer sole for a mountaineering boot. How are mountaineering climbs ranked? Oh, that's a tough question. <laughs> that is a tough question. Mountaineering is kind of uh, an outside combination of a bunch of different types of climbing. So sometimes inside of a mountaineering route, you'll have rock climbing, you'll have ice climbing, you'll have like glacier ice climbing, or you'll just have like a very long climb. So there's a couple different ways that you might see mountaineering ranked and graded. And there's a, a grading system that Seth is going to tell you all about. Yeah. The, uh, well, in North America, we do an alpine grade, and then it's also graded by the hardest individual moves of the climb. And uh, without getting into it, because uh, you could drill way down to this subject, but uh, alpine grade is uh, Roman numeral one through six, and uh, that just ha encapsulates the 
the totality of the difficulty. And uh, from there, you break it down into the hardest rock climbing moves. And then we use the Yosemite decimal system. And that's the five scale, five dot zero through the hardest climbs in the world are now 515 D, B, I don't know. Um, and uh, ice climbing, you have to add that in as well. So I have a water ice or alpine ice number grade one through seven, as Caroline George, our teammate, is familiar with the water ice seven grade. I am not familiar <laughs> with the water ice seven grade. But uh, water ice five and six, and then obviously the lower ones, one, two, three, four. Or you go the French style, a worded classification, and... Uh, it goes from a little bit difficult to yeah. very difficult. Très in, difficile, peau difficile, yeah. <laughs> that might be a more logical way to do it, actually. Mm -hmm. I think just doing some research in depth about what you're trying to climb and try to get as much info as you can it can help you maybe more even than the grading system. What food to take mountaineering? Food you like to eat. I feel like one of the biggest mistakes that I see my clients making is bringing um, really trendy, expensive nutrition uh, uh, replacement food into the mountains, like high calorie bars and um, like complex protein carb situations. And those things um, can be really good, but they also can be a little tough to eat. And so if you don't love it at sea level, you're definitely not going to love it when you're working hard up high. And so my primary food of choice are, are high nutrient foods that I actually just really like. So I, I'm a little bit of a child in this way. I just like to have like a peanut butter and jelly sandwich with me um, with like a significant amount of peanut butter for some good protein. I have a major sweet tooth, so a lot of quick, fast sugars that I know I'm going to be burning off easily, like gummy bears or... Um, simple candy stuff like that. I say mix it up. Yeah, have a variety if you bring uh, seven of the same bar and I'm just gonna eat two in the morning, uh, three in the middle of the day and two more at night. That's not gonna work for much more than the first day. So uh, mix it up, have a variety, sweet, salty, uh, science type food is what I call your bars and gels and that kind of thing. And uh, some real food too, some sandwiches and a good old PB&J is never, uh, never sounds bad to me. And what food do we eat mountaineering? The food that we cook. We generally have dehydrated food that's really lightweight and um, easy to rehydrate. So you can use like rices and potatoes and things that dehydrate down to super small and light and uh, rehydrate quickly with just uh, hot water. Mm. How do you poo mountaineering? The same way you poo when you're not mountaineering. You just need to be a little more careful with what you do with said poo when you're done. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we use leave no trace practices in the mountains. So if you don't have access to like park or uh, forest land managed pit toilets for your human waste, then um, you can carry bags that are specifically designed to carry out human waste and um, sort of keep it away from all of the rest of your stuff. But um, or if you're in lower land areas, there's other ways to actually manage human waste. But I think definitely manage knowing what you're going to do, having a plan for that, but going poo in your mountaineering. It's just the same as any other time, and exactly like any other time, nobody else wants to watch you poo, so don't stress yourself out about it. Everyone else is kind of doing their own thing. Yeah, most people, that uh, fascination has long since receded in their life, so just do your business, get it done with, and uh, try not to make a mess. How dangerous is mountaineering? It depends. Yeah, I think one of the most common answers to any question you have about mountaineering is, it depends. Yeah. It's like there's two things, objective danger and subjective danger. You know, in the environment you're climbing in, is there a rock fall? Is there ice fall? Is it really steep? Is there uh, fast moving weather systems that you can't control them? And then there's your own abilities. And so you can make um, any climb very dangerous and potentially with skill and training, you can make a lot of climbs really safe, except for that objective hazard. So it varies a ton depending on where you're climbing. Less dangerous than speeding on the highway. I think less dangerous, statistically speaking, than wingsuiting. Yeah, wingsuiting is pretty dangerous too. How to prevent altitude sickness mountaineering? Um, well, altitude sickness is something that happens physiologically and there's no sort of uh, ringer of predisposition. It's not like your fitness uh, predicates whether you get altitude sickness. So anybody can get altitude sickness, even people who haven't had it previously. And I think one of the best ways to prevent altitude sickness when you're mountaineering is to ascend slowly. And our sort of golden rule is to not increase your sleeping elevation by more than 3,000 feet per night. So you can climb up higher in the daytime and let your body start to do all the things physiologically that help you adjust to altitude, but then you go back and sleep down at a lower elevation and slowly move up and incorporate a lot of rest days to allow your body to catch up. 
yeah, stress your body a little, come down and rest, let it adapt. Well, basically what you end up doing on the, the larger mountains in the world is uh, find an elevation where you don't feel good, stay there until you feel good, and then go to another one where you don't feel good. So you're always feeling not so good. How many liters of water a day for high altitude mountaineering? This is a good question. It, it depends, <laughs> like most answers to mountaineering, um, on your output and um, your own efficiency and, and sort of what you're doing. But it is important to be replacing what you're putting out. And one of the things that you don't realize when you're mountaineering is oftentimes it's cold. And so you feel like, oh, I'm not losing much body moisture because I'm not sweating. But you're breathing quite hard and you're probably losing more moisture to respiration than you would normally for perspiration. So at a minimum, kind of no matter where I am, what the day is, I, I have a minimum of two liters of water while moving throughout the day. And then in the mornings and evenings, drinking a little bit more. But um, sometimes that's just not practical. You can't melt snow or there's not water sources. So you have to figure out how to teach your body to actually conserve the, the moisture that you're putting in, um, the water that you're putting in throughout a day. But I think as a good rule of thumb, I try never to go out on a, on a long day without at least one or two liters of water that I can have with me or get along the way. Yeah, I'm the same. Yeah, two liters, uh, any more than that carried on your person, uh, you might as well just pack a stove and uh, melt along the way. But um, mountaineering does require some difficulty, uh, not just uh, in the act of climbing, but just in living in the mountains and uh, sometimes you might be a little thirsty at the end of the day. Yeah, gotta balance out. The more you carry, the slower you're gonna go, the longer you're gonna be out there. So figuring out what's the magic equation. That's a lot of math. How to attach crampons to a mountaineering pack? Strap them on. Yeah, a couple of different uh, ways that you can do that, but I think no matter how you actually attach the crampons to your pack, you know, the crampons are the spiky things that you attach to your feet for friction when you're climbing on ice and glacier snow, but if you store them with the spikes of the crampons against one another, that actually protects a lot of the sharpness of the crampon spikes, so they're not as likely to penetrate through your stuff. And then I just put them on the outside of my pack or right on the inside top, but I generally try to keep them away from really permeable, puncturable surfaces like my down jacket. Um, and that's all the care I use. I don't use a crampon bag or anything like that. I, I usually have them sticking on the outside of my pack with the spikes or the tines facing each other. And I, uh, I take an inflatable mattress I use for sleeping and I roll my crampons up inside that. No, I don't do that. That would be crazy. Who does it? So yeah, just like Melissa, I put them spike to spike and then I wrap the straps around it really tight and then I thread the straps through their retention rings and tighten those and then tuck the little straps in and then I put them on the outside of my pack where they're not going to damage mm -hmm. fragile things like my sleeping pad. Mm -hmm. General rule, just keep your show tight. Try to have everything orderly, neat and looking tight. <sighs> What is the death zone in mountaineering? So the death zone is any elevation above 26,000 feet and it is called the death zone because our bodies physiologically cannot survive a prolonged period of time without supplemental oxygen or interventions like drugs at that altitude. So it's not, it's not called the death zone because a bunch of people die up there, but it's called the death zone because our bodies actually physiologically are kind of starting to wilt at that very, very high elevation. You bet. Cellular mitosis does not occur anymore. So cuts won't heal and uh, things like that. So yeah, your body is uh, not able to regenerate tissue or heal itself. You need to descend eventually. The borrowedest of borrowed time. <laughs> <laughs> totally. What do you wear for mountaineering? Well, there's a huge range of this depending on what the elevations and the temperatures that you're gonna experience, but I kind of call it my mountaineering costume. And my costume involves a lot of layering. So I like to start out with um, either a wool or synthetic base layer that's gonna be a long sleeve so I can protect all of the surfaces of my body and keep myself warm. And then I layer on top of that with wind and other weather protection items and pants, fleece, down, synthetic insulation um, options just for changing environments. When you're mountaineering, I think you can expect that you're typically out for a long time in the day, and so you're gonna maybe see sunrise and sunset, and you're gonna have a huge temperature range and possibly a lot of weather in those different environments. So it's not so much about what you wear exactly, but what you can wear and what you're carrying with you. Yeah, I think most people are surprised by how hot you can get, even when it's really cold. So uh, protecting yourself from the sun is paramount. I like. Uh, uh, thin base layers with hoods and uh, face masks and uh, light gloves to protect the back of my hands. Um, I tend to get 
overheated during the day and then cold at night. So what I have is like a linear system, very similar to what Melissa was describing. And I can, uh, as I get colder and colder, I just add more layers. And then uh, when sun comes up and I start to heat up, uh, then I just start dropping them and putting them in my pack in order. So it's all nice and efficient. Yeah, I think maybe Seth is the same on this. In almost every case that I'm gonna be mountaineering, my average is that I have three bottom layers and five-ish top layers, and then at least two pairs of gloves. And that gives me enough options to work with the whole temperature range. Yeah, a wide variety of temperature ranges is to be expected. So you gotta plan for being too hot and being too cold. What types of ropes are used mountaineering? Uh, well, there's two basic types of rope. You have uh, what we used to call static ropes, or uh, now more appropriately, low stretch ropes. And then you have a dynamic rope that's uh, specific to climbing. Uh, and so dynamic ropes can act like a bungee cord if you're lead climbing and you may fall. Uh, you're placing intermediate protection along the way. You're gonna fall past that before the rope catches you. And uh, you want that rope to stretch and absorb the shock. But uh, if you're gonna hang ropes, fix them on a mountain and climb up and down repeatedly while you're acclimatizing, then you want ones that don't stretch as much when you pull. And uh, for rescues, it's nice to have ropes that don't stretch. How to stay clean mountaineering. This is a, not a very good question for me because I'm kind of just generally a dirtbag in my life. But one of the things I like because I'm kind of a dirtbag in my life is that mountaineering is a little bit of a, a clean sport. You know, we're not typically in lowland dirty areas. Mm -hmm. At the higher elevations when you're on ice and snow, it's not like you're getting dirty from the atmosphere. You're just getting dirty from sweating and um, keeping your body you know, your body's normal functions of movement. And I, I use like a bird bath system with just like baby wipes um, as my intermediate cleaning in between like uh, bowl showers. If I'm out in a place where I can't have access to running water, or I can't rinse myself off, I'll, I'll do the baby wipes every day, at least once a day. And then I'll do like a, a formal proper bowl shower like once every week or two. <laughs> yeah, heat up some water. Have a washcloth and some soap, and that'll uh, that'll change your whole outlook on life, actually. Um, but yeah, after uh, yeah a week or two, you start to develop a nice sheen, and you kind of roll with it after that. So it's a fine art of like baby powder, sunscreen, baby wipes, <laughs> and then repeat. And having your own tent at base camp is nice, so you don't offend your tent mates. Or you just make sure that you can climb with people who are hard to offend. <laughs> <laughs> How to set a pace mountaineering? Great question. Yeah. So hard. Yeah. I start out my day and just try and uh, think about a pace that I will be able to sustain for the rest of the day. So if I feel like my heart rate is spiking up and down, I, I just uh, I use the analogy I start every day with a matchbook and I want to keep as many matches unburnt as possible. And so every time I climb a steep little step and my heart rate spikes up and I start to sweat and breathe really hard, that's a match and uh, I don't want to burn all those out by the end of the day. Yeah, exactly. I think people are often surprised that um, when you're climbing with people who do this professionally, we tend to actually go pretty slow. It's a sustainable pace and it's all about efficiency. You never want to red line uh, when you're at altitude. You never want to be panting, breathing hard because physiologically that just does some tough things to your body that make it hard to recover and, and have your day. And I always, just like Seth, I always plan to be out for twice the amount of time I think I'm gonna. And so I need to have that energy reserve. And that requires going kind of slow and efficiently and steady and being a bit of a tortoise. Yeah, the tortoise wins in mountaineering. Why are glacier sunglasses needed for high altitude mountaineering? Well, your eye protection is so important when you're doing high altitude mountaineering because one, you're getting closer to sort of our like general solar uh, spot, the sun, and those UV rays are getting more and more intense the higher you go. And then typically you also have glaciers where they're reflecting a ton of UV into your face and it's really easy to damage your eyes and, uh, and sunburn can lead to snow blindness on your eyes and be super painful and dangerous. People that have lighter colored eyes tend to suffer a little bit more, but if you go high enough and the sun's bright enough, then um, everybody can uh, become snow blind and it's basically, yeah, sun burning the inside of your eyes. Uh, and it's definitely painful and definitely bad for you. You only get one set of eyes, so wear sunglasses and uh, shield all, as much uh, of your eyes as you can from the sun. How does hydration keep you warm when mountaineering? 
Uh, when you become dehydrated, your blood vessels essentially constrict and your body's not able to perfuse blood through, yeah, the rest of your body out to your extremities. Dehydration just saps your strength and makes it harder for you to stay warm just because you can't get adequate blood flow. What terrain do you use an axe while mountaineering? Well, I find that um, when I'm mountaineering, I have an ice axe with me or I'm carrying an ice axe in my hand if I'm on uh, steep glacier ice or water ice where I need to have like a third point of contact and my hand won't do. And um, so anytime where I think I might <laughs> be in contacting ice, I typically have an ice axe with me yeah. and that could be glacier ice or water ice. The standard configuration for an axe is to use it like a cane. So anywhere you feel like a, a slip and fall uh, will result in injury or you're just having trouble maintaining your footing, then uh, that's when you need the axe. How to properly melt ice when mountaineering? Oh, this is a good question. So one of the things that I find is um, really key for actually melting snow to make water when you're mountaineering is to start out with a little bit of water in the pot. When you are going to get into camp, you need to make sure you have just a little splash for the bottom of the pot because this sounds really weird, but you can just burn water. <laughs> you can burn that ice in the bottom of the pot and it just starts kind of turning to vapor and it's hard to, to make water then. So I usually start with just a little bit of water in the bottom of the pot fill up my pot all the way with snow and I like to um, use really dense snow because it typically has more moisture in it if I can find it. Pack it in and then as soon as that starts to melt down and become water just keep adding in until you can tell that your pot's going to be full when all of the ice is melted and then having containers ready to transfer that. But I mean basically when we're doing some of these climbs you become professional water makers. <laughs> it seems so silly but you spend a huge amount of your time just making water. Yeah. And the longer climbs that are more remote, uh, like Denali is a great example, when you're carrying all the fuel in your team and you're not going to get any more, melting the water just so it is right past the freezing point and then filling up your water bottles. Uh, yeah, cold water is a little rougher to drink than nice, perfect room temperature water, but um, you'll save a lot of fuel in the long run by uh, yeah, just getting to like 32.1 degrees Fahrenheit and then putting that in the water bottle. What is self-arrest when mountaineering? Uh, it's the act of using your ice axe or whatever tools you have available to stop a fall. So if you slip and fall while mountaineering and you're sliding down a slope, you need to stop that immediately because no matter what's below you, you probably don't want to go there. And uh, yeah, there's uh, techniques that are, some are better than others, and, uh, but basically you're trying to stop yourself as soon as possible from having a total disaster essentially making your body into an anchor so you can just stop and hold everything. You don't want to be the, have the first time you ever try that be when it really counts. So practice, practice, practice. How many lumen headlamp for mountaineering? <laughs> the most? Lots of lumens of headlamp. But not too much <laughs> so that it's too heavy. I think, you know, your amount of lumens that you're using for your headlamp matter when you're mountaineering. It's actually, people I think think they need a brighter headlamp than oftentimes they need. If you keep in mind when you're climbing on snow and ice, the reflection of the light on the white actually kind of doubles the brightness of your headlamp. Um, so it's, you don't need necessarily the brightest one if you're going to be on snow and ice, but you do definitely need new batteries in your headlamp when you're going to go mountaineering. That's a way bigger issue than the lumens for people is, uh, headlamps dying because they're getting cold or you're getting a high altitude and getting dimmer and dimmer. Yeah, I think now you can get uh, nice uh, headlamps that are fairly lightweight that have up to 1800 lumens and uh, that's extremely bright and I, I like the brighter the better um, but yeah you just don't want it to be so heavy that it's going to make your neck stiff and hard to wear your hoods and stuff. So, How old is too old for mountaineering? No such thing. Mountaineering is for me, one of my favorite activities in sports because it's something that you can pick up really young and it's something you can do for all of your life and you can just adjust your playground to your own abilities. Yeah, pick your own goal for a mountain and uh, yeah, no matter your age, you can always, you can always find a mountain that's suitable. I have a lot of clients that started mountaineering in their 50s oh, yes. and, and still well into their 70s. Mountaineering, when you look at it through the lens of all there is to know, it can seem pretty intimidating and maybe like it's not that much fun, but once you get out there, I think it's really a wonderful experience to challenge yourself with nature and something that really almost anybody can experience. Yeah, the, there's a, 
a pretty easy barrier to entry to the sport and it's really easy to get involved no matter where you are in, in the continent and uh, it's also a great way to experience the world if you want to see other cultures, see how mountain people live around the world, um, it's a great reason to, to travel and see how other people live. That was the internet's most asked questions about mountaineering. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos like this. And send us your questions.